Hints for homework three. Okay, in the first problem, we want to prove that 11 is a divisor of n if and only if 11 divides this alternating sum difference of the digits of n. So the first thing to realize is that when we write n in its standard base 10 representation, this really means n is ak times 10 to the k power plus ak min minus 1 times 10 to the k minus 1. all the way down to the constant term a zero and the key thing here is just to work mod 11 so 11 is a divisor of n is equivalent to saying n is congruent to zero mod 11 so take this representation of n and just write down what happens when you view that mod 11. Number two, a divisibility criterion for seven. This one is not so common. I don't remember doing this when I was growing up. Uh, so again, we start with a base 10 representation. And I want to prove that n is divisible by seven if and only if the, uh, this number right here, that's the, again a base 10 representation, minus two times the ones digit is divisible by seven. So this time let's think of n as being this number right here. This is some uh, base 10 number, a k through a1. So it's not the product of those digits times 10 plus the ones digit. Okay, so view n in this manner and then again do it as a congruence problem. So something is divisible by n if and only if it is congruent to 0 mod n. And then this test right here is straightforward application. Problem three. So if P is a prime other than two or five, look at the decimal expansion of one over P. And being a rational number, it'll have some repeating pattern. Let's say the length of the cycle is K. And I want to show that k is the order of 10 mod p. So remember this notation means the order of 10 in the group of units, the multiplicative group of units mod p. Well, okay, so let's say 1 over p has some decimal expansion and it may have some initial digits, b1 through b r, let's say. And then we have some repeating pattern. Now it's going to turn out that r is really 0. One can show that. But a priori, I don't know that maybe there is some initial garbage right here before we do get the repeating cycle. And then um, multiply through, let's say by 10 to the r. And that will give me some integer point a1 ak. And then multiply through by 10 to the k plus r and you'll get something here. Subtract. And then what do you want to do? So you're going to subtract to get a whole number, eliminate the fractions, and 
and turn it into a congruence mod p. And you should be able to conclude that k is the order of 10. And you should also be able to note that r has to be 0 in this case. Okay, and then deduce that k is a divisor of p minus 1. Well, okay, that's an order of some element. So we have a general factor, but any group if you have an element of that group, then the order of A is a divisor of the order of the group G. That was a consequence of Lagrange's theorem. Part C, characterize those primes for which the order is in fact P minus 1. Okay, so, um, so yeah, what am I looking for here? Just uh, make some statement that involves the word primitive root. Just a, a brief little statement here. But it has something to do with the concept of primitive root that I'm looking for. Problem four, Chinese remainder theorem. So shall we just do a similar problem? congruence say 5 mod 13. I've got one of these in the notes as well. 37 x congruent to 1 mod 5 and find all integers x satisfying the system. So what I generally like to do is start with the largest modulus. That'll make the arithmetic easiest if we're just doing this by hand. So if I start with that largest modulus, we would have x is 2 plus some multiple of 37. So say 37 times s for some integer s. And then go to the next largest modulus right here. And we want to say x is congruent to 5 mod 13, so 2 plus 37s congruent to 5 mod 13, and solve for s. And 37 is what? 37 is negative 2. Right, it's um, 39 minus 2. And then multiply by 7 on both sides. 21 is 8. Fourteen is one, so this is negative one. So multiply by negative one on both sides and we get s is minus eight, which is five. Okay, so that at this point then we have x equaling two plus thirty seven times five. Um, well, let's go ahead and just calculate that. 2 to 37, that's uh, 187. Okay. And that would be mod whatever 13 times 37 is. Okay, and then finally we want x to be congruent to 1 mod 5. So x congruent to 1 mod 5, we have x is now 187 plus 13 times 37t congruent to 1 mod 5, and so on. And then solve for t, and that will give you your final solution. 
Now let me let me just stop there. I've said enough. Find a primitive root mod three to the five hundred power. Okay, so here I just start mod three. So step one. Find a primitive root mod three. Well, that's easy. There's not very many choices mod three. Mod three just has zero, one, and two, and the only units are one and two, and one is certainly not a primitive root. So two is your only choice here. And then we look at the Fermat little theorem. It says two to the p minus one power is congruent to one mod p and write it out explicitly. So 2 squared is 4 which is 1 plus 1 times 3. And this number here is not divisible by 3. So we have a theorem that says when you explicitly write out the Fermat little relationship, the uh, a to the p minus 1 congruent to 1 mod p relationship, and you look at this value right here, if that's not divisible by p, then in fact 2 is a primitive root. Mod any power of 3. And you can just quote the theorem. Find an element of order 10 in the group of units mod 125. So the group of units mod 125 has order phi of 125. And that's phi of 5 cubed. So that's of order, it's a group of order 100. We know it's a cyclic group because you're looking at a prime power. So I need to find a generator for this group. So step one, find a generator. Yeah, and that's, I don't want you to do this problem just by trial and error. I want it, I want it done in a nice systematic way. Find a generator for the group of units, mod 125, and use the same technique we did in problem one. Start with mod 5. So mod 5, what's a generator? Um, I think 2 again is a generator, so show 2 generates group. All right, two uh, then it's group mod five. Sorry. Because two squared is four, which is negative one, and two to the fourth power is plus one. Write out the, the Fermat relationship. The 2 to the p minus 1 is 1 plus kp. Look to check to see does p divide k. That's the question. If p is a divisor of k, you have to pass to another generator. If p doesn't divide k, then 2 is a generator for every power of 5. Okay, so that's step one. Once you have a generator, so let's say G125 is generated by A. So the order of A is 100. How do I get an element of order 10? Well, we have another theorem that says the order of A to some power K is the order of A divided by the GCD of K 
in the order of A. So use that theorem to come up with an appropriate power of A such that the order is 10. So set that equal to 10. And that should take care of that one. Problem six, find the order of seven in the group of units mod two to the n as follows. First of all, explain why the order must be some power of two. And for this, you just ask, well, what is the group order of that? And use the fact that the order of any element divides the order of the group. Next, prove by induction that for any k greater than or equal to 1, 7 to the 2 to the k power is 1 plus some integer, some odd integer, dk, times 2 to the k plus 3. Let's see, is that, did I state that right? When k is 1, this is 7 squared is 49 and I want to say that's 1 plus some d1 times 2 to the fourth power. So how does that work? 2 to the fourth is 16 so we're off to a good start. Now you do the uh, Induction assumption, suppose it's true for a given k, and then just square both sides to get that it's true for k plus 1. All right, then conclude that the order mod 2 to the n of 7 is 2 to the n minus 3 power. So I just use part 2. And I'm going to use it with a couple different values of k. So what do you want to do? If I, I want to look at what happens when you have 7 to the 2 to the n minus 3. And we need to show that this is the smallest exponent that works. So you have to ask yourself, what would happen if I took one smaller power? So you have to look at both of these and show that one of them is 1 and that the other one fails to be 1 when you're working mod 2 to the n power. And that should do the trick. Problem 7. Prove that phi of m times n is phi of m times phi of n times this product over the prime divisors of the GCD of m and n. Okay, so the question is, what for formula for the Euler phi function do I want to use? And I would recommend using one that says phi of n is n times the product over the prime divisors of n. P is a prime. So product over the distinct prime divisors of n of 1 minus 1 over p. So that's one of the ways you can write the formula for the Euler phi function. So use that version for phi of mn, phi of m, and phi of n and show that you get this extra quantity relating those those things. So in particular conclude this product uh, this inequality right here. Well that's going to be a trivial con conclusion. Problem 8. Prove that there are arbitrarily large gaps between consecutive square free numbers. And the hint is use the Chinese remainder theorem, that's CRT. And recall that a number is square free if it is not divisible 
by the square of any prime. So arbitrarily large gaps between consecutive square free numbers. So here's some things like this. Okay. So this is going to be square free right here. And this will be square free right here. And we want all of these numbers in between to be divisible by the square of some prime. So maybe we'll make this one divisible by 2 squared and make this number divisible by 3 squared, this one divisible by 5 squared, and so on. So if I can come up with a sequence of consecutive integers where 2 squared divides the first, 3 squared divides the second, 5 squared divides the third, I'm going to get a long sequence <coughs> of numbers that are not square free. <coughs> and so we'd get a big gap between these consecutive square free numbers. Okay, so how do we come up with this consecutive sequence of numbers, each divisible by the square of a prime? So let's call this number here um, n, and this one n plus 1, n plus 2, n plus 3, n plus 4, and so on. And let's call this prime p1, p2, p3, etc. So what I want is p1 should divide, now p1 squared I want to be a divisor of n plus 1, p2 squared is a divisor of n plus 2. Ah, okay. Now turn that into a congruence type of problem. and use the hint I put in the problem. This is where Chinese remainder theorem comes in. Problem nine. <coughs> Prove that for any prime not equal to two or five, there are infinitely many numbers in the sequence 11, 111, 11111, etc., all divisible by p infinitely many numbers in the sequence divisible by p. So let's think of writing these numbers in a slightly different manner. If you have a bunch of ones like this, let's see, this is n ones, so it'd be 10 to the n minus 1 plus 10 to the n minus 2 plus 10 plus 1. You can think of that as a geometric series. So what does it add up to? Ten to the n minus 1 over 9. Okay, so I want p to divide what? numerator. And now turn that into a, a congruence statement. And use something about, you know, orders of elements and when things, when powers are congruent to one and something along those lines. Problem 10. The GB and abelian group with elements A and B of finite orders M and N, such that the group generated by A intersect the group generated by B, is the identity element. 
prove that <clears throat> okay. problem 10 that G be an abelian group with elements A and B of finite orders M and N respectively if the group generated by A intersect the group generated by B is the identity element so the only object common to both the groups is the identity prove that the order of the product is the least common multiple of the orders of M and N of, of M and N it's the least common multiple of M and N so how do we get ourselves started? So we want to find the order of AB. So I want to ask what power of AB gives me the identity element? I, I guess I'm using 1 for the identity here. Well that would be implying that A to the K is B to the negative K. Well, the left-hand side is an element of the group generated by A, and the right-hand side is an element of the group generated by B. So here's a good hint. So what does this tell you about K? What is this going to tell you about K? Part B. Deduce from part A that if A and B are elements of finite orders M and N with M and N relatively prime, then the order of the product is M times N. So in order to apply part A, we have to show that this overlap is the identity. So how do we do that? So notice that, let's just let, let's call that group H. And let's think about what the order of H is. Well, H is a subgroup of the group generated by A. So by Lagrange, what does that mean? And H is a subgroup of the group generated by B which implies what by Lagrange. So you want to conclude that H is the identity. So now we can apply <coughs> problem 10A to say if this is the identity then the order of the product is the least common multiple. And you can wrap that up. Problem 11. Suppose R1 and R2 are isomorphic rings with group of units U1 and U2 respectively. Prove that U1 and U2 are isomorphic groups. Well, we, we're going to start with some isomorphism. Eta. B the isomorphism between R1 and R2. Okay, so that's a one-to-one -one correspondence that preserves both addition and multiplication. And now let's just restrict eta to U1. So eta, let's call it eta1, the eta restricting the domain to U1 which is a subset of R1. So then eta1 is a mapping whose domain is U1 and the range is still contained in R2. So the first thing you want to show is that eta1 of U1 is actually contained in U2. In other words, if you have a homomorphism 
and you look at the image of a unit, it's again a unit over in your range. And that's just using a property of homomorphisms. Okay, so that'll give you that A to 1 is a mapping into U2. And then conversely, you need to show that that if eta of A is an element of U2, then A is an element of U1. And, th and, and for this, you just use the inverse. So eta is a homomorphism, it's an isomorphism, and so it has an inverse mapping. So A to inverse is also homomorphism. And so what you obtain is that A to 1 is in fact an isomorphism between U1 and U2. Okay, so there's some details left for you to work out there. Part B, Suppose that Ri is a ring with group of units Ui. Show that the group of units in the Cartesian product is just the Cartesian product of the group of units like this. So suppose that we have A1, A2 through AK Okay, so that's a typical element of R1 cross cross RK. It's just an ordered K tuple of elements is a unit in this Cartesian product. What does that mean? Well, that means that A1, A2 times some other k-tuple is the multiplicative identity element, which is just 1, 1, 1, 1. And remember, your group operation in a Cartesian product is just component-wise. So this is just A1, B1, A2, B2, AK, BK. That and that means that a i b i equals one for all i. And therefore, the a sub i's themselves are units in the respective rings r one through r k. Okay, so that's the idea of the proof. So we have shown that if you do have a unit, then it is in fact an element of this Cartesian product. And then you have to show the other direction, that if you started with an element of this Cartesian product, then it is, in fact, a unit in R1 cross RK.